Would you like to know more about parasites? Well, then keep watching. All right, so welcome today to the Ask Dr. Pakel Show, where we help people find answers who have chronic health conditions, chronic health problems. And today we are going to dive into this mysterious weird world of parasites and uh, how they affect us. A lot of people ask me questions about parasites um, and it grosses most people out. So, you know, but I think it's good to talk about it. And I think you should understand because there's this invisible world, not always invisible, that is all, our, you know, that lives around us. There's these things that um, are in our body, outside of our body that we sometimes see and don't see that can affect our health and our health conditions. So I think it's important that we absolutely um, get to know these uh, these guys. All right, well, let's dive right in today and talk about these. Okay, so with parasites, there's basically two main types. There's what are called protozoans, which are really just kind of single-celled little tiny things. You're not going to really see these there. You have to see them under a microscope, um, extremely small, but can cause a lot of trouble. These are some common ones here. There's other ones, Cryptosporidium, Blastocystis, Giardia, Amoebas, another one called Strongyloides. Um, yeah, these are interesting. And then there's also helminths or um, kind of in the same class as flukes. Um, and these helminths are more of the worm type, the type that, you know, you, you always think, or gosh, that's just kind of gross. But basically, these worm type um, are also in different sizes. I mean, very microscopic. Majority of them you can't even see. To some of them, you actually can. And so that's real variable. These flat worms, which are also called flukes, which are extremely common. Round worms are common. Tapeworms are more common than what you would think. Um, these spiny headed worms, pin worms, we'll talk more about those. And then uh, hook worms, too. Uh, and then how do, how do we get these things? How are they transmitted? Yeah, this, when you say fecal oral route, what does that mean? That means that something we touched or something we ate somehow got feces on it. So let's say you went to a restaurant, somebody didn't wash their hands, they prepared your food, and it doesn't take much. It can just be microscopic amounts that got into your food, you ate it, and there you go. But again, so many other possibilities here. Um, in fact, we'll get into more of those two undercooked foods. So this would be um, especially undercooked meats like pork, beef, not as much chicken, fish. Um, and again, if you don't cook these things enough, yeah, you don't kill off the bad guys that live in them. Uh, and then the uh, water, when I say water, let's say you go swimming in a lake or a, a river or a um, pond. Yeah, and you dive in and that water goes straight in your face, goes to your eyes, goes and some of it gets in your mouth, some of it gets in your nose. Yeah, you've got some things that are potentially transmitted because there are things that live in that water too. Um, and that's variable. Pets. And here's where um, a downfall is that we maybe don't think about. So pets, I mean, dogs. Uh, dogs transmit tons of parasites. In fact, what do people do? They get their dogs wormed. We think about, gosh, we worm our dogs. Do we worm ourselves? Because, um, you know, well, of course, you see dogs out in the yard doing, all, eating, putting all kinds of things in their mouth and, uh, you know, cleaning themselves. And then they go and they lick their face. And everybody says, oh, dog saliva is safe. No problem because it, you know, kills things. No. Yeah, so licks you in your face, licks you in your mouth, licks you in your eye, you know, so you kiss your dog. Yeah, even cats. So cats, um, and maybe you've heard of this, you know, you should be careful in, uh, if you're pregnant being around like cat litter. Um, there's actually a, a, a parasite uh, in cat feces called toxoplasmosis. And yeah, not good for people. But yeah, if you're pregnant, potentially more susceptible. And then um, these... Um, uh, insect bites. So, uh, yeah, insects can transfer parasites. We hear about, especially the most common in the world is mosquito bites. Now, not as much in the United States, but especially in a lot of your third world countries, let's maybe say like South America, Africa, you get bit by a mosquito, you can get 
malaria. So malaria is a, um, uh, it's basically, it's from a parasite. Um, and uh, so definitely another way to get in. And, you know, there's other theories on how other, in, in how insects can transmit parasites. And then fresh and raw foods, they, oh, my fresh foods, my raw foods are so healthy for me. They are healthy for you. But yeah, if you look at food under the microscope, if I go out and pick something out of a field or, you know, grab some food fresh from the grocery store, look at it under the microscope, all kinds of little guys and their eggs in there, I hate to say, very common. We don't even think about these, but it's just, it just happens. And even if you scrub them and wash them, you can't always get that stuff out, especially the eggs, things. So again, these are going to come into us almost no matter what we do. So we'll talk about um, a little more as we go on, on what to do about this and then travel. Yeah, if you travel to foreign countries, especially, you're being exposed to parasites that you potentially aren't used to here in the United States. So those can maybe cause you a little more trouble. But this is kind of interesting just to know some different types. All right. So kind of like we talked about, uh, how do you, how's your risk increased of getting parasitic infections? Because the thing is, is if we are consuming parasites, their eggs, pretty much on a regular basis, unknowingly, uh, why do some people have problems and some people don't? Well, number one, weakened immune system. If you already have an immune system that's having problems, especially the immune system in your gut, which is about 85% of your immune system, then yeah, the, you know, you may not be able to kill these guys and they thrive. Um, and then they can go to different areas of your body too, or just stay in the gut. Uh, if you have an autoimmune condition, kind of similar thing, you already have an immune system that may have a problem. So you may be more susceptible, leaky gut. If you've already got gut issues, um, SIBO, if you know what that is, uh, watch our other videos. Um, yeah, low stomach acid. Now this is a big one because if you think about it, what's What's one of our first barriers of defense when we eat things uh, to parasites, bacteria, things like that? It's our stomach acid. We need to have a good amount of acid um, in our stomach. And that stomach acid kills the majority of things. But we see a lot of people who have um, low, low stomach acid. You know, when your doctor or even the commercial says, oh, you've got too much acid in your stomach. No, that's not really what it is. You know, that's not what causes reflux and heartburn and GERD and all these things. Actually, it's because you don't have enough acid, then you can't break down your foods and that food that you just ate just sets in your stomach and starts to rot. I hate to say, watch one of our other videos too, it explains this, that food ferments, makes bad acids and gases. Those bad acids are what cause the heartburn and the reflux, not the hydrochloric acid that our stomach is built for. So again, that, that stomach acid is pretty crucial and and killing a lot of these bad guys before they get into our gut in the first place. Um, and which goes into this next one, PPI drugs. If you're taking a PPI drug, an antacid type medication, you're lowering your stomach acid. Um, so yeah, you just opened up the door potentially to some bad guys. Um, if, you're, if you've used antibiotics, antibiotic overuse, this creates more dysbiosis. This kills a lot of the good bacteria, which are part of your defense mechanism too in your gut, part of your immune system, actually. I know bacteria help us. Um, frequently eating at restaurants or frequently eating fast food. Yeah, you kind of open yourself up a little more because you don't know who's touching what and if they even wash their hands. And then too, if you have high stress, physical stress, emotional stress, or really even chemical stress, high stress, what does that do? Lowers your immune system, opens the door to this. Because if we get these guys in our system, the acid in our stomach, the immune system in our gut should zap them. But if it doesn't, if it can't, then they're like, hooray, and they start to thrive, and then they have families and, you know, kind of interesting stuff. Not trying to gross you out. So what are some symptoms of um, parasites? All right, so we get to number one, you know, and it's not a lot of times when we think, oh, gosh, when I got parasites from this fast food place, I instantly started vomiting and getting nauseated and all this stuff. Yeah, but that could be from parasite bacteria, food poisoning is food poisoning, but it doesn't always occur that way. It's not always such a reaction. These guys are kind of sneaky, especially if it's just parasites. 
their goal isn't to kill their host. Their goal is to live in their host and enjoy the resources of their host, feed off of their host. So, um, but yeah, just especially if you notice changes in, in the bowel movements where, gosh, you know, my bowel movements have always been like this. Suddenly they're more soft or more diarrhea. Suddenly I'm more constipated than usual. Again, there's a lot of other things that can do that too. But now here's a big one, mucus. And I think this is uh, not looked at enough here because mucus is the defense mechanism of a big part of your body, especially your gut. Your it, it, mucus is supposed to trap things and help pull them out. You know, kind of if you like, if you blow your nose, all that mucus comes out, green stuff, and it's like, hey, what is that? Well, that mucus traps bacteria, traps other stuff in your sinuses and your nasal passages where you blow it out. Yeah, it's 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 helpful. And your body's going to keep making it until it gets out what it thinks is, is bad. Same thing is going to occur in the gut. The gut actually makes mucus to try to trap these bad guys and pull them out. So when you start to see mucus in your stool, big sign you have parasites. Also blood in the stool because they can uh, cause it. Now there's many causes of blood in the stool too. So if you ever have a lot of blood in your stool, definitely uh, get check, get tested because there can be other reasons for that. And it's not always just parasites. Now, this is another interesting one is sleep disturbances. So parasites tend to be more nocturnal. They tend to be having fun and doing their thing and eating when we're trying to sleep. So many times what we'll see in parasite people with parasitic issues is they will have insomnia. They'll wake up during the night and they'll be like, gosh, what the heck? Why all of a sudden am I waking up every night at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m.? No reason at all. So big sign of parasitic issues. Um, and then um, as far as itchy skin, so parasites do an interesting thing. They increase histamine levels in your body. So what do histamine levels do? They kind of drive allergy symptoms. Histamines can cause you to feel more itchy all over. So yeah, all of a sudden I've got allergies that have just appeared out of nowhere. I never had allergy problems in the past. Now all of a sudden I've got allergies. What the heck? And it could be allergies to things in our environment. It could be allergies to foods all of a sudden, but out of nowhere, why did that occur? Well, possibly a parasite. Now, when I say itchy and it says anus here, this is related to a worm we just talked about, pinworms. That is like textbook. If a person has what we call anal itching, I know it sounds gross, but this is just, hey, you probably 90% of the time you're, you have pinworms. And an interesting way to find out on that, and I'm not, again, trying to be gross here, but what you do, they actually call it the scotch tape test. So you can actually take a piece of scotch tape, put it down there at the anal exit, we'll call it, leave it there overnight. And when you take it off in the morning, it'll look like little white strings on there, little teeny tiny white strings. Yeah, those are pinworms. So pinworms are active when you're sleeping and they come out um, they mate and then they go back in when it's daytime. Now, the thing is, is they also can get on your sheets and travel to a different person. Pretty common infection in the United States, rarely talked about. But again, and there's ways to get rid of these, but definitely that's um, one of the signs. And I just talked about allergies. If you have unusual fatigue because parasites rob your blood sugar, they really mess with your blood sugar and inflame your gut. So this can start to cause you to feel more tired. Plus they rob your iron. So, which I'm going to get to in a minute, another symptom is anemia. So, um, well, we'll get to that. But um, uh, also, if they activate your immune system enough, yeah, you can get flu-like symptoms. Yeah, the nausea and vomiting can occur. I don't see that as like a always or very often to tell you the truth. And then, um, you know, if all of a sudden I've got this unexplained health condition, I don't know where it's like, wait, how come I all of a sudden got this? I've been healthy forever. Sometimes this could be parasites creating um, just different health issues. Um, unexplained weight loss or gain. Sometimes certain parasites will actually feed on your blood sugar enough, block your absorption enough. Think about this. If, if parasites are inflaming your gut, you're not going to absorb very well, except for the sugars and carbs. The tiny molecules will get right in, but that's going to sometimes cause weight loss or inability to gain weight. Although other parasites can do just the opposite they can affect your gut to where you actually um, 
or absorbing and maybe going more into a storage or famine mode and your body starts to gain more weight than it should. So it can really kind of work both ways. Here's an interesting one that you don't hear about. If you've ever known somebody who grinded their teeth when they slept, it's like, hey, my kid always grinds their teeth. Big sign of parasitic issues. Um, again, they affect the sleep-wake cycle. Here's what's even more interesting. They affect the neurotransmitters in your gut. Now, neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, these are the neurotransmitters, the brain chemistry that affects emotions. So can parasites affect our emotions? Absolutely. It is totally in the research. It's just never talked about. We're going to get to that a little more here. Um, sugar cravings. Yeah, I find many people who have parasitic issues will crave these sugars and carbs a little more. It's mainly what you're absorbing because your gut's inflamed. So your body's like, I need energy. Give me more of that. Plus, if it affects neurotransmitters, if they affect neurotransmitters differently, this could also increase um, sugar cravings, uncontrolled appetite. Yeah, hungry all the time or sometimes aversions to certain foods. Here's what's interesting, too. When people have, let's say, a beef tapeworm, um, I find it. And this is just more of a clinical example. Sometimes I'll find that these patients have either an aversion to meat. They'll be like, uh, I cannot eat red meat anymore. It just totally makes me want to throw up. Or they'll say, I need red meat all day, every day. I, it's my favorite thing. It's like it can go either way. And I'll see the same thing with pork tapeworms too, uh, tania solium. So uh, interesting there. Um, and then um, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. I was talking about this. There are actually studies, I mean, because especially when I put one on the end here, schizophrenia, what the heck? <clears throat> totally. In fact, remember the ones we were talking about, pinworms, related to schizophrenia. They don't just have to stay at the um, anal entrance there. They can move around through the body. And um, absolutely. And there's other studies, many studies showing how these affect our emotions, how they affect our brain chemistry. Uh, we got to remember the gut and the brain are totally connected. Gut inflammation equals brain inflammation. Neurotransmitters can be affected. All of this, it's weird and wild, I know. Here's another one, seizures. If you know someone with seizures, hey, is it due to parasites? This is never looked at, never talked about. People get put on anti-seizure medication, just kind of, hey, that's how you live, you got them. Could it be that you have a parasite? Not only affecting your gut, but there's many examples of parasites that have affected the brain directly. Um, and then nightmares or even night terrors. I've had many patients come to me with what are called night terrors. Not good. Scary, scary, scary. Um, and if you've never had one, read about it. I don't want to go too far on this. But again, um, or just, hey, I'm getting a lot of nightmares more than usual. Yeah, parasites, big potential there. That's kind of textbook also. And there's the anemia as I was talking about. So yeah, parasites tend to rob the iron. So it's like if you go to the doctor, they said, hey, you're iron deficient and you're not bleeding, you know, or you're not having extreme periods or you're, you know, they're, they're, or, and you're eating irons and everything. So it's usually not issue of not eating it. Sometimes it can be an absorption issue, but a lot of times a parasitic issue. Okay. This is also interesting. So symptoms are worse during a full moon. I had a patient who came in who she would get lower abdominal pain anytime there was a full moon. She didn't correlate it at first, but it would go away and come back. And finally, her husband was like, it's full moon every time this happens to you. Um, so kind of interesting. Um, but yes, there's actually documents to talk about this. And um, also because parasites are animals, they're going to breed more in the spring and fall. So they're more active at these times too. So there is this seasonal side where they tend to create more symptoms for people. We'll find out a lot of the times, um, you know, when I say breed, they're, they're laying eggs. I know it sounds horrible. All right. Muscle joints, pain, brain fog. Yeah. All these things, parasites can relate to, to so many symptoms. All right. So the national institutes of health says, about 18.2, they kind of give a range to 38.1 million cases per year. And you never hear about this. 40, close to 46,000 people annually in the United States die of parasitic infections. 
why don't I hear this on the news? Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, the thing is, is this is only going to include diagnosed cases of people who they're representing have parasites because really a very small percentage of people get diagnosed with parasites. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. And again, if you're chronically infected, you know, the doctors are not going to relate it anyway, because you've just got probably a chronic health condition that you're being treated for with a medication or something. And then also so many people are going to be undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or just never even go to the doctor for their symptoms. So these numbers are super low. Now, if you do suspect you have a parasitic infection, are they going to do endoscopy, colonoscopy? That's usually not the main method of, of finding out if you have um, a, uh, a parasite, because the thing is, is these parasites don't just live in the lumen of your gut, in the hole of your gut. Now, number one, well, number one, that. Number two, the gut is about 20 feet long. And when they scope you, let's say they do a colonoscopy and scope you, they're only getting a small amount of your colon. They aren't even looking at your small intestine. And then even if they do endoscopy and go down your throat, they're looking at your stomach in the very beginning of your small intestine. They're going to miss everything. Number two, most of these guys are microscopic or they live under the mucosal layer of the gut. There's no way you can see them visually with a camera. So those methods are not going to work. The main method that's used is a stool test. But here's the problem. If you start to read about stool tests and research with them, I've heard, heard some sources 10 to 20% accurate. Other sources say 8% accurate. Sad. But the thing is, is, if parasites are alive and thriving in your body, they're not going to exit out. They're very hard to find. Even these tests that are PCR DNA, are not great ways of finding these things because they are only testing for specific parasites. They're not looking for all and any. Um, the test only allows you to look for some specific things. And the ones that I've done in the past, mm, they're not looking for the ones that are more common. I, I hate to say that. It's very frustrating. I just find out they're very inaccurate. Um, and then if you look at a blood test, you know, um, one of the key factors doctors will tend to look at sometimes for parasites is what are called eosinophils. And eosinophils are involved more with parasites, candida infections, and um, allergies. So when they see these elevated, mm, throw out the parasites and the candida. Let's go towards the allergies because we have something to give you for that. We can give you an antihistamine, which if parasites or candida are driving your histamine levels, yeah, it may help with symptoms, but it doesn't help the cause. It's very rarely looked at, but in the research, in the textbooks, eosinophils, yeah, check for parasites, check for candida, parasites especially. And um, But the thing is, is it doesn't always show up with parasites. Eosinophils won't always elevate when people have parasitic issues. Uh, in fact, it's not even that common that they will. Sometimes basophils will ele elevate too on the blood work. And then sometimes you can check immunoglobulins and immunoglobulin E will increase. But a lot of times these will also increase with allergies. So doctors will just kind of put it off to allergies. All right. Um, you know, another thing too, while we're looking at this, I kind of uh, was thinking to myself, hey, do I really want to kind of um, bring a, a picture or a little video into this? But I'm going to spring it on you guys here. All right. So I don't let this gross you out too much. I won't leave it on, on the screen here too long. But the thing is, is um, parasites, look at them. I mean, they're microscopic. There's no way you're even going to see these when they get into the stool. Now, there are some that you can, but the majority are just super tiny and um, you're not going to see a lot there. So uh, what can we do about this? Um, what's some information on that? Because these guys um, are extremely common. Um, diet, I would say number one, you need to have a healthy diet. If you already think you have a parasite, which majority of people in the world do have some. In fact, to tell you the truth, we all have some parasites. Uh, they actually, some of them work for us, just like we have good bacteria too. So you really would never get rid of every parasite in your body. But 
There's also some that are more troublemakers um, that we don't want, more pathogenic types that can really create trouble and they're just kind of out for themselves. So, um, but, but having your diet correct is, is really important because gut health plays the biggest part in this. If you're making good amounts of stomach acid, if you've got really good gut bacteria and your digestion is great, hey, you're probably not gonna have any trouble with these guys. Even if you go eat out somewhere, you might eat the wrong thing and it's a problem. So the problem comes in is when your immune system is being compromised. Usually when people have chronic health issues, autoimmune condition, if you already have health condition, bigger chance you have parasitic issues. Um, and usually with the highest percentage of health conditions, there's immunocompromised. The immune system is being squashed or suppressed by something, whether it be heavy metals, chemicals, other infectious agents. The thing is, is to find those things because many times people will have recurrent parasitic infections where they'll say, oh, I killed my parasites, but they just came back or I keep having these symptoms. I'm taking all the things or doing all the things, but they just keep, they're, they're either persisting or they just keep coming back. That's because the causative agent that's affecting your immune system is, is still there. Uh, the immune system is being suppressed by We'll say some mercury or some cadmium that's stuck in your body or some chemical you've been exposed to at certain time in your life that your body just never got rid of that's keeping your immune system down or you let's say you've got like lyme disease where the, the bacteria is attacking your immune system which keeps it down and keeps the door open to these other bad guys so these are the scenarios and the situations that we have to look at because rarely is it ever just parasites they're part of the problem but they're not the complete cause of most people's problems. But to just help out, yeah, your diet. Um, go decrease the gluten, the dairy, the soy. Decrease sugar and alcohol. These are things that lower your immune system. Not only lower your defenses, but parasites love sugar. <laughs> You're gonna really grow some populations there. Um, increase your, your dietary intakes of coconut, garlic, onion. These things that I've listed here, kind of interesting how they are related. And then um, for your gut health, there are supplements that kind of help the gut to become stronger um, or the gut lining. And I've listed those. And I would say don't take all those separately. You can find formulations uh, of that take, contain all those things at once. And then antiparasitics. These are what you hear about most. These are more herbal or botanical things that parasites do not like and tend to help the body rid them. Um, black walnut hull, clove flower, garlic bulb. I've, I've listed these here. Now, some of these, you know, it's like, hey, the, when these go into our gut, do they, the parasites eat these and they kill them off? Maybe, maybe they're getting into your bloodstream and what's happening is the parasites are feeding on your blood sugar. And so, yeah, these ingredients get into them. They don't like them. But also, a lot of these stimulate what's called the Th1 side of your immune system, which is the SWAT team side of your immune system that goes into action and starts to fight the battle also. So there's kind of multiple fronts, whereas like there's one down here lower, this uh, mimosa um, pudica. Uh, seed, which actually creates more of a thicker mucus uh, that kind of drags things out. So, but, you know, a lot of these are under the mucosal layer uh, is where they live. So they aren't just on the surface of your gut. They can burrow their way deep. So, but it is, it's this effort to try to get populations down, get rid of them, also avoid things in our life or be cautious with things that can um, increase them or create um, uh, more um, problems here. So, yeah. So parasites. So basically, what's the cause? What's the? Is it just parasites, or is it other things? It's usually multiple, and it's getting rid of all this these bad guys. But those are just some hints and tips to help you with your parasite population. Again, be cautious with taking any herbs and botanicals, especially if you're on other medications or if you have an autoimmune condition because you could stimulate the wrong side of the immune system. So uh, just to kind of let you know on that, let's see here. All right. Um, hi, Angela. Uh, said might have this. Um, yeah, y'all, you want a sugar? 
absolutely many people with these issues craving sugar also candida will tend to cause sugar cravings and just really if the gut's inflamed you're not absorbing well and um, except for the sugars and carbs, you won't absorb the proteins, the fatty acids, the minerals as well. So, you know, the tendency is to crave more sugars, too. So, yeah, but usually anything that's inflaming the gut could increase your sugar cravings. Let's put it that way. Um, how do we get tested? Uh, Sandy's right. <laughs> yes. Go see Dr. Michael. Yeah. So uh, there are other ways to test. Uh, which uh, is more of a, what we call bioresonance type testing, which is the only way I've found to really find this stuff. And then there's other ways to get rid of it besides the supplements, especially with um, more of like a causative homeopathy that easily gets rid of this stuff. So, or hopefully easily, sometimes it can take some time. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoyed today's information and um, God bless. And I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.